Welcome, everybody. So, welcome to the Department of Computer Science and Technology, perhaps more affectionately known as the Computer Lab. I'm Alistair Beresford, the current head of department. So, I'm pleased to welcome you to this event, uh, provide you with some background information about uh, why we're interested in launching a new centre uh, and what we hope to accomplish. I thought I'd start off with thinking about a little bit what our mission is. So this is the university's mission, to contribute to society through the pursuit of education, learning and research at the highest levels of international excellence. And so we do this for computer science. Uh, and for us, uh, as in many parts of the university, formal education, learning in all its forms, uh, and research are all intertwined and intermixed. And this has been true uh, from very early on in the department. So the department has been uh, going for 87 years, uh, founded as the Mathematical Laboratory in 1937, uh, because the word computer in those days was often a job title or description of someone's role. Uh, and uh, after the intervention of the Second World War, uh, we had a new head of department in that era, Morris Wilkes, who took over and set his aim as building a program stored computer, uh, the EDSAC, which first ran in 1949. Now, his aim wasn't to make a profoundly new design or make key uh, huge uh, leaps in terms of engineering or computing in any one particular part of this system, but to build a system that was uh, usable, reliable, and could offer service to other people across the university. And so this uh, uh, early effort and endeavor led to uh, David Wheeler to complete uh, possibly the first PhD in computer science in 1951. So the aim of operating a service naturally brought with it the desire uh, to uh, bring informal learning through summer schools and workshops into play uh, right at the start of this machine's life. And quite quickly it was realized that a more formal course, a one year of instruction, a uh, so-called diploma, uh, was required to get people able to use the computer to its maximum effectiveness. And so we launched uh, the world's first uh, taught computer science course, uh, the diploma in 1953. Over the decades, this course has turned into uh, our undergraduate program, which now uh, supersedes the diploma. Uh, and this first appeared as an undergraduate program in 1971 called the Computer Science uh, Tripos. Initially, a one-year program set in the third year of study after two years of studying another course. We had the MPhil uh, initially with engineering in 1985, and now our MPhil in advanced computer science has been running since 2009. So this combination of undergraduate, masters, and PhD programs is something that we've been doing uh, for many years now. If you want more information about the background of both research and teaching in Cambridge, there's a lovely book, uh, Cambridge uh, Computing, the first 75 years, uh, and you can download a free PDF copy from our website. In terms of uh, background, there's also some historic relics on display outside in the, uh, you can have a look at in the coffee break. So we've got things like the, the Marchant calculator. This is an uh, electromechanical device that will uh, compute additions, subtractions, multiplications, and divisions, as well as um, some artifacts from those early days of computing in Cambridge. So a horn attached to the EDSAC, which I'm told was used to uh, sound. Uh, the program has, uh, the computer has finished, halted, and the program is complete. Uh, and also in those early days, uh, it was common to try and attach a speaker to uh, the computer. So the speaker's role was to provide some sense and background noise about how the program execution is running. Uh, and uh, the speaker would allow the experienced operator to know whether a program, for example, is stuck in a loop. Uh, and David Wheeler was quoted as saying that the only problem was that as computing advanced, it became harder and harder to attach the speaker. <laughs> So from those early days, also, so teletype, tape readers, uh, the Titan, which succeeded the EDSAC II, uh, and also the CAP computer that Simon Moore will talk about in a bit more uh, detail, because it relates to some current research going on in the department. By the 1970s, we're into computing and the Cambridge Ring and how to interconnect uh, lots of computers uh, to collaboratively work together. And then uh, the BBC Micro and Raspberry Pi, uh, more recent endeavors we've been involved in. I think another really part, good part of this early story of uh, history in the lab and something that we continue to do well is work with industry. Uh, and uh, we don't just therefore undertake excellent research, but want to see how we can see that have impact in the real world. 
So it's sort of uh, unusual for academic departments to want to do this, but it's something that we've been doing uh, from the EDSAC onwards, and I thought I'd uh, talk a little bit about uh, how that has come to pass. So the Lions Tea Company uh, was a very large endeavor in the 1940s, uh, and uh, was very forward-thinking, looking for a way to improve its productivity and automate tasks, and they invested £3,000 in the EDSAC computer uh, early in its uh, development. They also had a, an engineering member of staff come and work alongside Morris and his team. And once the EDSAC started to function, Lions invested much more significantly and built their fir the first business computer, the LEO, or uh, Lions Electronic Office, around that idea of the EDSAC. And so Leo went on to save huge amounts of time uh, for Lyons. Uh, it, traditionally, it would take a clerk with a mechanical calculator six minutes to compute a payslip for each employee once a week. But with Leo, they could do 40 in a minute. Uh, Leo was also put to task on computing rain tables for the military, aerodynamics of flight, personal uh, processing data from market research, uh, and computing shortest distances between all uh, railway stations in the UK rail network. And there's a great video uh, produced by the Centre for Computing History here in Cambridge about the LEO, if you want to find out more about that. In terms of uh, this working with industry is something, as I say, we've continued to do. And uh, we don't just, therefore, undertake excellent research, but look to see uh, for the impact. Uh, and I picked three examples which connect with me uh, personally in my own uh, career. So the BBC Micro is the first. I finally remember this machine uh, from uh, school classrooms in the 1980s when I was a kid. Uh, and the department was uh, involved in lots of this personal computing boom in the 1980s. Uh, and I had a look the other day that the ROM credits include uh, Andy Hopper listed in uh, the ROM credits, as well as the Computer Lab and Peter Robinson. The second one is the Zen Hypervisor. So this was a, a wonderful piece of academic research looking at we've got programs that are written for uh, different operating systems, and we'd like them to share a physical computing resource. How could we do it? But rather than stop there with the great academic output, uh, the researchers then took that idea, turned it into a, a startup company based on the open source code they'd written, uh, which was then eventually sold for Citrix, and also used by Amazon for its Elastic uh, uh, Compute Cloud for over 10 years. And finally, the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I remember Eben showing me an early version of the Raspberry Pi computer when he was still here uh, in the department. And again, this was something the department really got behind. Uh, uh, Rob Mullins, uh, Jack Lang, uh, Alan Mycroft and others starting a charity to see this single board computer and make its way out into the world. So funding in the department uh, often uh, is related to industry and typically we fund PhD studentships uh, by donation uh, and this is an opportunity for us therefore to engage with industry uh, in this process. Um, here are a few examples. I think uh, I wanted to highlight Qualcomm as a particularly uh, interesting example where they made uh, a, a donation, significant donation, which endows a PhD studentship. So we have one new Qualcomm student every year or two uh, starting the program, and this can carry on forever. Arm, um, Netflix, Meta, Entrust, Google, including DeepMind, also support PhD studentships in the department through donation. And Raspberry Pi Foundation and Nokia Bell Labs have also supported research centers, so a slightly bigger uh, endeavor, and a topic I'll come back to later on. So why do we think um, academia and industry should work together? Uh, I think there are some differences in how we operate which are beneficial to both parties. So we like to think long-term, we like to generate disruptive ideas, and we have lots of uh, really smart young uh, students come along who uh, don't know that things are impossible and do the impossible. <coughs> Another task that we, I think, take on well is to training the next generation of computer scientists with our degree programs. Uh, but we also get to connect across the university. So uh, we you know, can connect with sociologists or criminologists or uh, other areas of expertise when that's useful uh, to get uh, some piece of research done. And we also operate in an open and pre-competitive manner. So we publish our papers in the university's uh, repositories so anyone can read them and we release software under open source licenses. Well, that's good, but having impact in society uh, requires some kind of connection to industry at some point, and that transition is important to us. So uh, part of the feedback from industry is not just delivering on that transition, but to also then provide us with input and ideas on what the future trends might be from their perspective, or what the challenges are at operating at scale. 
Uh, and we also work with industry to transition our ideas. Uh, and that's not just the technology or the academic papers or the software, but also the people. One of our biggest outputs are, are the students that we teach. So today we work across 10 different research themes. Uh, the five on the left we might think of as the classic core computer science topics such as algorithms or programming languages. And the five on the right we might think of as uh, core computer science areas that focus around some particular application area or otherwise cross-cutting in their uh, focus. So uh, graphics or mobile systems or security interconnect with the other core areas. And I'm proud of the coverage that we have uh, in the research themes that we have. We don't cover every possible area of computer science, but we have a pretty good coverage given our size. Now, I'd like to highlight that these don't represent organizational structure or silos in the department. Uh, indeed, many staff work across uh, multiple themes, and this is encouraged and indeed expected. So, for example, I work across mobile systems and security, uh, and the Cherry project that Simon will talk about later sits across computer architecture, systems and networking, programming languages, semantics and verification, as well as security. And you can find out more about the themes and who works on them on our website if you would like. In terms of uh, our sort of overall structure, size and shape, uh, we're a modest size, very much research oriented, research driven uh, department that values uh, teaching at all levels. So we have, uh, here are some approximate numbers rounded to the nearest 10 uh, of uh, the different components that make up uh, the department. So Cambridge recently adopted the US style academic title system. So the old titles of university lecturer, senior lecturer, reader and professor have now been replaced with assistant, associate and full professors. So we have 53 of these non-emeriti professors. Uh, we also have around 110 postdoctoral researchers who are funded off our research grants. And depending on how you count, between 140 and 200 PhD students. Uh, and these researchers and PhD students uh, work across all of those 10 research themes. We have two master's programs. So we have the MPhil in Advanced Computer Science with around 65 students and the uh, MEng degree, so students who wished it from our undergraduate program stay on for a fourth year, uh, there are about 35 of those. Uh, combined with 130 undergraduate students per year, on our three-year program, um, and 50 professional services staff to keep us uh, in check. Uh, interestingly, we have quite a number of visitors in the department. And so again, that liaison, that connection to industry is something that's important to us, uh, and we continue to do that in a significant way. So we're here today really to think about a new opportunity, uh, the Computer Architecture Research Center. Uh, and this has come about because we have a a very exciting uh, collection of really enthusiastic and driven faculty who are real experts in the area that they work in. Uh, and we, across the whole department, look at all areas. Uh, um, and in my one-to-ones this year with um, so many of the faculty, one of the key areas they'd like to do more of is to teach more PhD students. Uh, now, we don't have problems in terms of applicant numbers. We have huge numbers of uh, applicants apply. Uh, and so many of them extremely well qualified and we give out many academic offers. But unfortunately, uh, we don't have enough funding to support all of those we would like to take. Therefore, they're unable to come. And so uh, we think that both industry and academia would benefit from more research in computer science, and in particular in computer architecture. We have the capacity to deliver more of that, but we need to do something to try and improve the funding situation. So part of the motivation for starting this new center is to try and increase increase our capacity of PhD studentships. Now this is something that we've done a couple of times already at a slightly smaller scale. So I thought I'd give you a, a bit of a flavor of two examples of this we've been involved in already. So the first is the Center for Mobile Wearable Systems and Augmented Intelligence. Uh, this was launched by Cecilia Mascolo and myself in 2018. And our motivation was somewhat similar to that uh, of the Computer Architecture Center. We had many excellent PhD student applications. We made offers, uh, but and then you couldn't start due to no funding. Now, Nokia Bell Labs agreed to fund this center by donation for five years, uh, and we've primarily used this funding to support PhD studentships uh, as in that endeavor. But we've also sometimes used this to support uh, postdoctoral researchers where we need extra capacity in a particular area, or we already want to push something through to uh, completion. 
So the donation model has provided significant flexibility to us in the way that we operate. So for example, we can match money from Nokia Bell Labs with uh, a partial funding or award from a, a college, and we therefore benefit from additional capacity as a result of that. So uh, we currently have nine PhD students in this uh, particular center who are partially or fully funded uh, through this model, as well as one postdoctoral researcher. And we work then with Nokia Bell Labs researchers in a variety of ways. They actually have a, an office only a few hundred meters uh, from us here, and we attend each other's seminars. We meet up as researchers, and we produce an annual report on uh, what we've been up to uh, as a way of uh, checkpointing where we've got to. Some of our students decide that they'd like to do internships in industry, and so some of them go uh, to Nokia Bell Labs, some go to other places. We had five go to Nokia Bell Labs last year. And six of our PhD students on graduation over the last five years have decided to take a job with Nokia Bell Labs. So this relationship has worked really well for both parties, and last September, Nokia Bell Labs agreed to renew funding for this center for a further five years. So the second center that I've been involved in is the Raspberry Pi Computing Education Research Center. And the story for this one is a little bit different. So for a while, uh, Andy Rice and I uh, ran uh, the platform for IsaacPhysics.org, a platform to support teaching of maths and physics in UK schools. Uh, and this was delivered jointly with the physics department uh, here, who we did the platform design innovation, some of the teaching pedagogy, and the uh, um, uh, operating of the platform. And then the physics department ran the uh, content events, outreach, uh, student engagement, teacher training, and so on. And it was hugely successful and continues to, to be so. Uh, and then when the Department for Education in the UK uh, said in uh, 2018 they wanted to do something similar for computer science, we looked around for partners and we partnered with Raspberry Pi Foundation to launch uh, a similar uh, platform. We still run that today as Ada Computer Science to talk. So the challenge that we discovered though doing that was that we didn't have as thorough an understanding of how to teach computing as we had of how to teach physics and maths. And so uh, we partnered with the Raspberry Pi Foundation to launch a new center into how to uh, improve computing education uh, as a discipline. And so and we launched that in 2021 with a donation from Raspberry Pi Foundation. We've had further donations from the foundation, as well as significant donations from Microbit and Google. So why is computer architecture a good choice for one of these kinds of research centers? Uh, I think there are a number of different reasons. Um, not just that we are very good at doing computer architecture in this department, but also that uh, the government funding for uh, PhD studentships, the Center of Doctoral Training or Doctoral Training Programs, there is no one of those in computer architecture in the UK, and as far as we know, no plans for one either. Uh, as we've already talked about, we have a long, rich history and lots of capacity to uh, uh, support computer architecture research in this department, and a strong local ecosystem of companies uh, working in the same area. Uh, and we continue to invest in this space too. We've just hired two new professors in the last year, uh, Tobias and Prakash, uh, who are also really at the heart of this particular research theme. So the aim of today is to really tell you what we're doing uh, a little bit more in computer architecture and start a conversation on the challenges uh, that we see coming up in terms of research topics uh, and how we might run a centre. So to help us do that, here's the plan for the rest of this afternoon. So uh, first of all, we've got uh, Rob Mullins, who's going to talk about uh, low risk and their opportunities and innovations that's happening in that particular space, uh, followed by Simon Moore, who's going to talk about the Cherry Project, a significant long-standing project in the, in the department that uh, builds on uh, four different research themes in the department. We'll then have the coffee break, and have a look at some of those historical artifacts that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then, uh, I guess... Research centers are, are, are focused really around those PhD students and postdocs, so we're going to hear from uh, four of the, uh, our early career researchers talking about the projects they're working on now. And then finally, uh, Tim Jones, who is uh, our proposed director for this new center, is then going to provide some more details about what we're planning to do in terms of operating the center. So with that, I'll hand over to uh, Rob. <laughs> 